there is, uh, there's almost always a possibility of improving someone's function. And that we, we, are, we are sort of labeled as the place to go for aggressive gait training. We actually get orders that come to us that say, patient referred to the gait clinic for aggressive gait training. So we are proud to say that we aggressively gait train our patients. So what I'm going to show you about today, first of all, I have no conflicts of interest here. So here's what we're going to talk about briefly. Um, Dr. Becker just mentioned that central pattern generator, that sort of wiring that's at your spinal cord that helps you produce stepping. So we're going to talk about that for just a moment. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the things that we have determined need to be key elements if you want to get gait recovery. And again, I was, I was asked, and I, uh, I want to thank the association for asking me to, to participate in this very important symposium. I was asked to talk about gait recovery. I mean, we've already hinted at the fact that not everyone achieves gait recovery. But what, what we're going to talk about in this little block of time that I've got is, is, is how do we promote gait recovery in people who've had injuries in the spinal cord. Some of the patients that I will show you do have TM. Some have other spinal issues, and I'll explain those as we go through. And then what we're going to spend most of our time doing is talking about treatment options. So if you came to our clinic, which again is a gait disorders clinic, what kinds of things might you do? And I would certainly agree with you. I do a lot of traveling. I do a lot of speaking to therapists all over the country. And there are a lot of therapists who are not familiar with, with gait recovery in this population or, quite frankly, with patients with neurologic problems in general. Uh, but I'm happy to report that our team right across the street uh, would not fall into that category. Uh, so this is a picture uh, of the Gait Disorders Clinic. This is just a little snapshot, and you'll see some of these things. This is a computerized gait map we that we have in our clinic that we use for gait analysis and some other things in there. So over at our clinic, we have a very strong philosophy, and we all believe the same thing. And we all believe that we really are trying to get this very thing right here. We want to get the best possible practice that you can achieve when you're trying to recover walking. So we want you to walk the very best way, and we want you to walk as much as possible. I want you to practice. And we've already heard from some of the other speakers that, that you know, Dr. Zakowski kind of mentioned the idea that you might come in and see a therapist and get a program and get it tweaked, and then you go off and do your thing. What we tell our students and our patients the same thing is therapy does not happen in the clinic. Therapy happens outside of the clinic. Therapy happens at home. So our job is to get you set up so that you can do practice outside of the clinic because if you're expecting to learn how to walk in the clinic, it will never happen. So we want you to practice, practice, practice. So just a couple of words about that central pattern generator that Dr. Becker mentioned. And what that means is that there's some wiring, just like the chicken who lost his head, that there's wiring in your spinal cord that will produce a stepping response. And what we, when we do some of our treatment strategies, what we're trying to do is to take advantage of that wiring, to try to trigger that wiring to make you take a step. And we've known about these as, as early as the early 1900s. They discovered that there were some stepping responses that did not come from your brain down. So there seems to be, from the research that we had, there, there are a few things that trigger that response or trigger that central pattern generator. So one of those things is that you want to get your leg into a trailing limb position. So that just means I need to get my leg behind me because I really need to stretch my hip. If I don't stretch my hip, then it's very difficult to activate that pattern generator. The other thing is I need to reduce the tension on, on my calf muscle, and I need to have good weight bearing in the middle of my step. So I need to have my foot solidly on the ground while I'm in the middle of my step. So what we, what we have in our clinic is what we kind of call our roadmap or our Bible of how we structure therapy. Because we've all been associated with therapy that really wasn't very effective. And so several years ago, in 2008, a basic scientist by the name of Jeffrey Klein wrote a paper. And what he outlined in that paper were 10 principles that you need to apply if you want to promote that rewiring or plasticity that we've already heard about this morning in your brain and in your spinal cord. What needs to happen? How do you need to structure your interventions? And so every time when we come up with a treatment plan for a patient, we keep these principles in our mind. How do we want to structure therapy so that we make sure that we promote recovery? So the first one is very simple. Use it or lose it, and we've all heard that before. And what that means is, is that there is a concept out there called learned non-use. That if you don't use wiring in your brain and your central nervous system, then you lose, you, you lose the ability to do it. How many of you ever done a skill a long time ago? I grew up in the, I, I'm a Texan through and through. I grew up in the garden spot of America, Amarillo, if any of you have ever been there. <laughs> 
It's sweet. Most people have the same comment. I drove through there once on my way to Colorado. That's the comment I get most of the time. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was held prisoner there for many, many years. And w when I was growing up in, in uh, I can't tell you what decade that was, but I was growing up in Amarillo, what we did in high school was we bowled. Okay, that's what we did for entertainment. If you've been in Amarillo, you'll understand that. There's not much else to do in Amarillo but go bowling. And, and so all through high school, I was a pretty good bowler. And, and then I didn't bowl for about 30 years. And then lo and behold, the next time I picked up a bowling ball, I wasn't so good anymore. I was really good at the Wii, but not so great at the actual bowling alley. So that is an example of learned non-use. I, I had a skill, and I forgot, I forgot how to do that skill because I didn't use it. And there's some really very interesting evidence about this concept in spinal cord injury, that, that it really is, there is a component of your loss of ability to walk that may be related to this idea of learned non-use. But the good news is, is that repetitive walking training, and again, there's that term repetitive, may reverse some of that phenomenon of learned non-use. So intensive walking training has been shown to be effective in improving walking in patients that are several years post-injury, as we've heard from Dr. Sadowski. So the other principles that were outlined by Dr. Klein are use it and improve it. So that makes sense to us, right? The more you do a skill, the better you get at it. Specificity, this is a really interesting one, and we've not been so great at this in therapy. And specificity, specificity just means that if you want to do a skill, if you want to get better at a skill, you need to do the skill. So in our clinic, when our patients come in and their interest is walking, which is what we mostly do at the Gait Disorders Clinic, you can imagine how we spend our time. We don't lay on the mat and do bridging. We don't lay on the mat with weights on our legs. We spend our time walking. So we want you to walk in the clinic, and we want you to walk at home. Because if that's the skill you want to learn, that's the skill you have to do. We've already hinted at this before, repetition, 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 repetition. A lot of the times, and there's an enormous amount of evidence in this in, in the neurological disease realm, is that a lot of the reason our patients don't get better is because they, they do a fraction of what they need to be able to do to learn a skill. For you and me to learn a new skill, assuming that you have a fairly intact nervous system, it typically takes at least 10,000 repetitions of a skill to learn it. And when you do therapy, oftentimes you're in the clinic, like we talked about, you've got 15 visits, you're there for 30 or 45 minutes, what do you think the odds are you're going to learn the skill there? You're not. So if we can't structure it so that you can do it away from us, then you're not going to learn that skill. Intensity matters, and this is, again, we've, we've hinted at this at previous talks, you've got to stick with this for the long haul. I mean, Dr. Becker talked about using the STEM and using it long term. So whatever treatment plan you've got, you've got to stay with it for the long haul. Time matters. As a rule, it does. There's pretty good evidence that it helps to start early, but it doesn't mean that you can't get recovery long post-injury. Salience matters, and this is a really important one when it comes to therapy, because if I give you some exercises to do at home, and I want you to go sit in your chair at home and do long arc quads, okay, how many of you are really interested in doing long arc quads sitting in your chair? Probably not. I'm not interested in doing that, okay? So if it doesn't have meaning to you and if it's not something you want to do, then the odds are you're not going to do it. So I need to make sure that when I'm developing a treatment plan that I've incorporated what it is that you want to do. And age does matter. Oh, my goodness, age matters. The older you get, I can assure you, age does matter. The younger you are, the easier it is to have this sort of plasticity in our system. Uh, transference is the ninth principle that Dr. Klein outlined, and that just means that once you begin sort of getting your system into the mode of learning, that it's easier to learn another new skill. And then the last one is one that really is important to us, and this is the idea of interference. And what that means is, and Dr. Sadowski talked about this, is that doing something the wrong way promotes what we would call maladaptive learning, so that you learn a skill in a way that, that really doesn't promote optimum learning of it. So when she structures her, her, her practice, she wants it to be the best possible practice, which we've already mentioned. So what does that all mean for us? What it means for us in the Gait Disorders Clinic when we're structuring our treatment plans is that I want to see, I want to do everything I can do to try to get that central pattern generator back in the game to either avoid or reverse the, uh, the learned non-use effect. And we do this in a lot of different ways. And what I really want to do for the rest of the time I've got is just show you some videos and talk to you about some of the patients and some of the, the, the tools that we use in our clinic. These are not the only tools out there. They are just the ones that we are 
fortunate enough to have in our clinic. So electrical stimulation, we just had that wonderful talk by Dr. Becker about functional uh, electrical stimulation, and we are huge fans of it. We, we have really, over the last few years, I think sort of morphed how we use it. We used to use a lot in the clinic, where we would put it on somebody in the clinic while we were there. More and more and more, we have begun giving it to patients and asking them to wear it all day long. So we set it up, there are, different, there are different systems. The easiest to use is a little heel switch. So if you've ever seen a little a portable unit, they have a little switch that goes in and you can put a heel switch in your shoe. And when you step on it and unweight it, it triggers the stimulation. Uh, so this first little video, and you're gonna see this kiddo in several videos. This is one that is fairly current. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the story of this child. These videos are funny. When you film in QuickTime and you film off of an iPhone, they, are, they have their own little rules. You can be fortunate that the sound is off because she's giving the sweet resident some lip about this. Uh, which she, she gives us all lip every single day. What you can see here is she has electrodes. She has a little wire that's down in her uh, right shoe because her right leg is stronger. I'm going to run this again a couple of times. So she's got, come on. You can do it. She's got electrodes right here. Dr. Becker talked about the little electrodes. There's an electrode here, and there's one up higher on her leg. Same thing on the right leg. And when she steps on this switch, it triggers that stimulation to come on. And it actually alternates between her left leg and her right leg. It was really funny. We started using the stimulation with her, and we just put it on her left leg because her left leg is a lot weaker. <coughs> and what we noticed after about a month or so, she was sitting on the mat, and... Her left thigh was about a third size bigger than her right thigh. Her right leg is still stronger, but that stimulation was, was causing some hypertrophy or growth of that left muscle, so we put it back on her right leg so that we could get her legs a little bit more the same size. This gal is a, when we started seeing her, she was almost 11 years old. She had a Ewing sarcoma, a cancer in her chest wall. And when they did surgery to remove the tumor, she ended up having a stroke in her spinal cord, so she is classified as a spinal cord injury. And when she came to us, she was about six months after her injury and had been told by several physicians and several therapists who didn't quite know what to do with her that she had no potential to walk. So this is an 11-year-old child who just survived a traumatic cancer and was told that she would be uh, forever in a wheelchair. Um, and when I look at those 10 principles we outlined, uh, particularly the one about age, <laughs> I thought to myself, surely we're not going to not give this child a chance to get a gait recovery. And as you can see, she certainly has recovered the ability to walk. And you'll see her in a couple of other videos. So something else we use a lot of, we are enormous fans of bracing. Have any of you ever worn an AFO, an ankle foot orthosis? There's different kinds of braces. We are huge proponents, and the reason we are is because we want that brace to help promote the best possible walking that you can do. Okay? And there's lots of different kinds of braces, and I will tell you that my experience, again, has been with therapists, that most therapists are not comfortable with bracing. They're not comfortable with brace prescription. They don't know what kind of brace to give you, and oftentimes patients get the wrong brace, and then they end up actually doing worse with the brace. So if you've had a bad experience, I'm going to ask you to put that behind you, because there are some good braces out there. Uh, now, this is a brace we do not use a lot, but I want to show it to you. And this is my sweet friend again here. And this was a while back. She can see she's made enormous progress since then. But this is my little kiddo walking with a KAFO. You can see when she turns around, this is a brace that goes all the way from her thigh all the way down to her foot. It's a knee ankle foot orthosis. And the reason we put this on her was because her left leg was really, really weak. And we needed her to be able to walk more independently. So we gave her this brace. She only used it for probably, I would say, less than two months before she progressed out of it. And we actually took the top piece of it off. And now she has, you can see she has another brace on the right side. That's an AFO, an ankle foot orthosis. That's, uh, she's the only one who has that beautiful tie-dyed uh, fabric that the orthotist put on for her. But we ended up taking that piece off. And instead of using that top piece, we put e-stem on her quads. And we allowed the e-stem to extend her knee instead of that brace. Uh, but I wanted to get her independent walking at home, and this was the best way to do it. I will say as a rule, we're not a big fan of that kind of brace. Usually a brace that, that's, that, that is that big and that clunky and heavy does not really facilitate walking. And the bad thing about it, you can see she had to walk with a really, really stiff leg. And that's really not how you and I walk. So we, we don't use those very often. We do use AFOs all the time.
Um, the locomat, has anyone heard of the locomat? Has anyone seen the locomat? You'll see someone here on the front row who knows it very well because he was kind enough to let me videotape him in the locomat. The locomat is a very um, unusual piece of equipment. It's fairly expensive, about a quarter of a million dollars. Um, that was the old, that's the version we've got, which is several years old. They may be more expensive now, I don't know. But it is a robotic device. So robotic means that it will do the work for you. So if you are completely incapable of walking, can't move your legs, the robot will do it for you. And so I'm going to show you a couple of videos here. So you can see it's a pretty slick device. There's a frame here. You can't really see the frame, but you can see it's the straps going up. The patient has a vest on. We put a vest on really tight. It has some little groin pieces that sort of keep it down. We put it on really, really snug, usually sitting on a mat or laying down on a mat. And then we wheel you up. There's a nice big ramp up here that comes up onto the locomat. And you can see this is what's called the exoskeleton. And the exoskeleton just means it's the robotic arms. And, and so the straps are attached to an unweighting device. And we may pan back a little further. I don't think you can see it. So we strap this all around you. There are straps to hold the patient's feet up. In this case, the patient has braces on and they are doing the work for him. Okay, and then we turn on the computer. You can see right here there's a computer. We set it all up, get it set up to this particular patient, and you can have the robot do as much or as little of the work as possible. So you can be completely paralyzed and walk in this device. There are not a lot of them in the country. Uh, there are several in VA centers now. They've put them into a lot of the VA hospitals. Uh, but it's a very slick tool. We use it oftentimes to sort of jumpstart somebody, to try to get the system kind of revved up again, get that good sensory input for what walking should feel like. And then what you'll see on this video is this is another, just a front view. What you'll see is what we've done is combined electrical stimulation. So he's got the same setup as our little kiddo did. Uh, there's a pad right up here, way up high on the thigh, and then one right down here. And this is hooked up to a very expensive e stim machine that when it reads the joint angles in the locomat, and when we set it up just so when it reaches a certain angle, the e stim comes on. So right before he finishes his swing, right when his leg is just about here, the stimulation comes on, helps extend his knee, keeps the stimulation on while he loads, and then right up to the middle of his step, when you and I, our quads would typically go off, we have the stem go off, and then his leg gets into a prone position. But you can see the advantage of this kind of a device. You can see how it pulls your leg back into hip extension. And remember, we said we need to have your hip back into extension to be able to trigger that central pattern generator. So it's another really nice feature of the locomat. Again, you're not likely to see those in many facilities just because of the cost. What we tend to do more and what I've done for many, many years, particularly in patients with stroke, is use manual body weight support. And manual body weight support is a very similar setup, except it takes a lot more manpower. Okay, come on. There we go. Oh, oh. Now, if any of you are geniuses to figure out how to make this thing go away. I continually have this problem with my computer that I can't get it. There we go. Okay. So this is a manual body weight system, and it's a little hard to see, but you can get the idea. That this is a treadmill. This is one of my colleagues, Stacy, from over in the Gait Disorders Clinic, and this is our technician, Bo. What he's doing is stabilizing the patient, and she's got a nice piece of tubing or sock on his foot, and is basically helping him move his leg. Now, you can see he is strong enough to move his left leg. This is a young man who was, uh, was it an MVA? Was that was? Self-defense. Oh, he felt he had a fall uh, and sustained a spinal cord injury. So she's moving his leg, and we've got some nice vertical bars. I've got another video I'll show you of him on the treadmill. This is uh, obviously another day because Bo got a lot prettier here. <laughs> Hold on here. No, sorry about that, Bo. Nothing personal. Come on. Yeah, see? Yeah, it just looks quite different that day. It's kind of odd, but yeah, yeah, it was, it was a big change. <laughs> Uh, so you can see this is Melanie, again, one of, our, one of our colleagues in the Gait Disorders Clinic. And you can see the vertical bars that we've attached. This looks a little bit ghetto, I'll completely admit that. But I, I really like someone's arms up instead of leaning forward and holding onto the lateral bars. So we just got some PVC from Home Depot and, and attached it to our treadmill setup. So, we, yeah, we are, we are, we, we are, we're used to working in the ghetto. So we got all kinds of ways that we can modify. But again, Stacy's down here really working on stabilizing his pelvis and helping him shift his weight. Um, 
And again, this is the system that I quite frankly prefer for patients who have more function because I think it makes the patient be more active and more engaged in the process of walking. And I really want the patient doing the work. I want you to figure out how to do it because I want you to go home and do it at home. If you can't do it at home, then we're probably wasting our time. Uh, the Peristep is a really fun system. Uh, it's a really old system. Has anyone ever heard of a Peristep? They're pretty old. Again, this sweet gentleman up here who's been in our clinic for a while knows just about all of our tricks. So the Peristep was devised many years ago, and they actually are still around. I've not seen one newly fabricated in many years, but it's a system that is, it utilizes functional electrical stem, so you put electrodes on. There are a couple of different setups you put. You put them on, on your quads, okay, so that when you step on your leg, it'll hold you up, okay? You put them on your hip extensors so that when you step onto that leg and your trunk goes forward that you won't collapse. Because those of you who have a lot of weakness know if you get too far forward and your hip's not strong enough, you're going to jackknife. And then there's another setup that you put right on the sides of your legs, and when you hit that, it triggers a reflex and allows you to step. So this is all hooked up to a walker. The wires plug onto your legs and they plug into the walker and then as you stand up with the walker, you hit the buttons and you trigger the steps off of the handlebars of the walker. So this is not a great video, I apologize. This was, um, this was taken off of this patient's dad's phone and so it's not, it's, it's not the greatest quality but you can see it. There, I am behind and we've got Bo and Stacy right here and this is the young patient who's got, and this is a young gal who has transverse myelitis and she has not walked for well over a year. And we put the stem on her, and, and she just hits the stem, and it, and it really allows her to take a step. What Stacy and Bo are doing is helping her displace her feet, uh, and I'm making sure that she stays upright and shifts weight from side to side. And you can see by her face there, she was kind of having fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a really cool system. It looks, it looks a little bit archaic, <laughs> and the setup of the, of the stimulator is a little bit challenging. I'm not sure. I think that was done when the technology was really... I don't think where it is today, and so it's a little hard to operate, but it's a pretty slick system. Um, pretty fun. Uh, just a couple more things. We are, uh, we, again, we use all kinds of walkers, canes, crutches, and, and we have all kinds of fun walkers and different walkers, to, again, based on what the patient needs. One of the things we use a lot, and I've seen some of our folks in here today use forearm crutches. We really like forearm crutches. They're a really good tool, and I'm going to show you three clips here. And these were done, two of them were done the same day, and then one was done about probably five or six months later after this gal had had some practice. But this is a patient who has transverse myelitis. She came in walking with a walker, um, and I asked her if she could walk without the walker. And this was her first effort. Now, I, actually, this was the second day I saw her. The first day I saw her, and I'm, I'm pretty nervy, but her walking was so unstable, I was not willing to let her walk without an assisted device. But here she is. Again, she's had uh, TM for several years. And this was her walking without her walker with no device. I mean, clearly she can do it. Um, and with her walker, she still had a lot of trunk movement. She was better than this, but still had an excessive amount of trunk movement. And the very same day, this is the same day, the second day I saw this gal, I gave her a pair of forearm crutches to try. And here's the very same gal, the same day, walking with forearm crutches. Yeah. Now, I like this because it makes me look really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> and there, we have a rule in our clinic, your job is to make me look good. And so she was like, she looked at me and she was like, I don't understand that. That's better than my walker. And really, the reason we like forearm crutches so much is they really do allow you to walk with that nice reciprocal walking pattern. You know, we talked about, Dr. Zakowski talked about the symmetry, that our brains really like symmetry, and that we'll figure out what it takes to make ourselves walk symmetrically. It's easier to walk with this nice, symmetrical, more typical walking pattern. But the nice thing about these crutches is they stabilize your trunk. And if your trunk is weak, you know, some, you're going to do all kinds of things to stabilize yourself if you have a weak trunk. Now here's this gal several months later after she uh, had used crutches for quite some time and now here she is with a single crutch and this is how she was walking in the community. Wow. Okay. Again, once again, <laughs> you go girl. Uh, and you'll see uh, that she's, you can see her, she's got a, a really fancy crutch. There's a website where you can buy fancy crutches. They will, they will take these little lightweight, they're called walk easy crutches, and you can decorate them. You can customize, you can personalize them, you can do all kinds of stuff. They're really slick. 
Um, another tool that we use a lot in our clinic is called a gait trainer, and there are different kinds of gait trainers. I'm going to show you just a couple of kinds. And we use them sort of based on where the patient is and, and what they might need in their recovery. And again, this is my sweet friend um, some months ago. This was last fall. Uh, and we tra started treating her in April of last year. This was really the very first day. You can see this little device is kind of hidden with her pink shirt, but it's a four-wheeled system. This was one of the very first times she ever took steps independently by herself in a device. And the gait trainer is really slick. It has all kinds of things that you can attach to it. It has straps you can attach to your legs if you have trouble with p placing your feet. It has straps you can attach to your thighs if you have trouble controlling your thighs. There's a, and you can see there's a little harness here, a little, um, kind of like a little saddle. There are two different kinds that, that will support you if you were to lose your balance. You couldn't really fall in it. It would hold you up. You can see it's got uh, arm, kind of like for, uh, platform attachments, and it also has another piece that goes around your chest. Now, by this time, we had already peeled most of that off. All she's really got here are the forearm attachments and the little seat. Uh, and now she's walking in this device. This is, um, it's called a Nimbo. It's a, another kind of a gait trainer, but it is a, considered a reverse walker. And so now she, you can see she's pulling it behind her. Um, it's a much smaller device, doesn't have all the other bells and whistles, but, uh, but also uh, extremely useful. Reverse walkers are nice if you've never seen one. They really allow you typically to stand up much more straight than a forward walker, which tends to pull people over. And that was a few months ago, and now here she is in the one that she um, uses at school. It's the same device, but you can see from the back, and you can see how much stronger she's gotten. And you can see now from the back, it has this nice little seat that folds down. Now what she tends to do is just pop herself up on the back and sit on the back of it. Uh, because the nice thing, these, these wheels reverse lock, so if she were to back up, the walker stops, and so she just stops it and pops herself up on it. And there she's giving me more lips, so it's a good thing the sound's not on. There she goes. She popped herself up on it. That's how she sits on it. She prefers that. We rigged up a whole system where she could pull down the seat, and she's like, forget it. So she just pops herself up on it. Yeah, children are so resilient. And the last one I'm going to show you about is a new device called a TRAM, a, a transfer and mobility device. This is made by the same people that make that gate trainer, the pink one you just saw. And it was really interesting when we saw the video earlier of the little figures walking on the treadmill and how just after a very short period of training time there was an adaptation there. They sort of learned that. We, we experienced it with this. This is a gentleman who has a different kind of spinal pathology. It's not transverse myelitis and not a typical spinal cord injury. You can see the, the trouble with his walking. Very short steps, very stiff. Okay, and you can see in this device, one of the things I hate about this device is do you see how flexed his posture is? Yeah. Really don't like that. And there's another little video clip of him coming around the corner. Actually, this is the one on the this, this is one of our gate mats. Again, you can see that really, really short walking. And we, we've been treated this. This was a patient that Melanie treated, began treating last year. And when he, when he first started, he was, even from this videotape, so much worse. He literally was just, this was how he was walking. And we, we didn't videotape him then. We videotape almost everybody. And, and then we were, he, we were doing a treatment. That the resident is now treating him. And we pulled out this device. This is called the tram. Okay. Now, you can immediately see the improvement in his walking. His legs are bending, he's standing up straight, he's taking these nice long steps, and we're like, what the heck? I mean, what is up with that? And I'll show you one more little clip and you can see it from the side. It's a pretty slick device, and it will actually stand you up. So you can see it comes up high here. It's a big frame. This is Heather, my resident. She's just guiding the walker. So we put him in this device, and he, I mean, he literally walked like we'd never seen him walk, just like this, long, smooth steps. We were like, well, we did it a couple of times, and the next time he came in, I said, would you mind if I videotaped you for this conference I'm going to talk at? And I said, I want you to use your walker, thinking he would do this. Well, he gets up with his walker, and he's like this. <laughs> oh, dude, no, no, I really want this. <laughs> <laughs> His walking, his wife said his walking has been so much better with his walker just after practicing. And I think the value of that device, one of the things that makes that device so cool, is do you see where it comes? It comes up way up high and stabilizes his trunk. And once he's got his trunk stabilized and his confidence is good, then he's able to just take off. 
So, you know, we actually were trying to get him one of these units for home, but I'm not sure that he needs it. Just a couple of practice sessions, and he was good to go. So it was pretty exciting. It's a new device that we've just got, and, um, and, we're, and we're kind of playing with it. So here's the bottom line. We're after the best possible practice, and we're after lots and lots of task-specific repetition. That's what we think does the best, op the, the best option. And we'll hold our questions for later, but you have to see Bishop. This is one of my sweet little cats. <laughs> so um, my time is up. Thank you all so very much for your attention. <laughs>